Good morning. How are y'all? And, oh, hey, I have a slide that tells you who I am, if I can get it up. There it is. Hey, that's my name. Uh, hey, guys, I am Toby Palmer. I am the director of student ministry and local missions here at Fellowship Bible Church. And here on Youth Takeover Sunday, I am delighted to have the honor and the privilege of sharing God's word with y'all. Um, so thank you for being here. Thank you for participating. Um, I wanted to start out kind of in a place of vulnerability, because uh, I think for the word of God, that's often where we should be. But I wanted to talk today about inadequacy and calling. Um, and specifically, I wanted to start out with one of my deepest fears. So I don't consider myself a necessarily fearful person, but there are a couple things that really, really get me. If I'm being honest, one of them's the dark. I'm 27 years old, or I'll be 27 in September. I have two kids, and of my family of four, I'm probably the most afraid of the dark. Now I brave it because I love my wife and kids, and I'd rather the boogeyman get me than them. But, <laughs> but I'm still afraid of the dark. I'm also weirdly afraid of heights, but I love roller coasters. Can anybody relate to that? Yeah, yeah, like I love the thrill because I'm certain that my go-through is going to be the one where the roller coaster fails. Um, and somehow that makes it more exciting. Anyway, uh, those are relatively minor fears, though. I can cope with them. I can get over them. But one fear I've never been quite able to get over is what if I do not have what it takes? And I would be lying if I said this didn't impact really my entire life. I am terrified. So I'm, I'm a scholar. I'm working on a PhD right now. I'm actively writing and publishing. I'm presenting at conferences. And I was talking with my wife the other day because I'm presenting two conferences at, or two papers at the Evangelical Theological Society this coming November. And I was talking with my wife and I was saying, you know what, when I got my master's degree, before I got that, I was like, you know what, maybe when I get that, I'll feel like I'm equipped to do what God has called me to do. And it wasn't true. And I was like, okay, wait, maybe I need to wait till my first presentation or my first PhD seminar. So I got an A in my first PhD seminar, I presented my first paper, and I still didn't feel good enough. I got that paper published in a major journal, and I was like, maybe I'm still not good enough. I got my THM, a second master's degree, and I'm like, maybe I'm still not good enough. I'm midway through my PhD program now. I have been given honors by the school I'm at, and every time I step into a classroom, I still feel like maybe I don't have what it takes. I have imposter syndrome. When I was playing football in high school, I practiced so hard because I was terrified of the fact that maybe someday I was going to stand across from somebody who was just that much better than me, and that I was going to let my team down, I was going to let my coaches down, I was going to let my best friend down because we played football together, and that because I wasn't adequate, I wasn't going to be good enough, and then the people in my life would suffer as a result. And as a dad and a father, it's, it, this is the kind of thing that keeps me awake at night. Now, my wife will be, will be honest with you. I, I don't stay awake at night very easily. I'm usually the first one to sleep. But, <laughs> but on the nights when it is hard to go to sleep, this is the reason. What if I fail my family? What if I'm not good enough? What if I don't measure up and because of that, my family suffers? And when it comes to my relationship with God and what I feel like he's called me to do and the path that he's led me on, there are times, quite often, where I look at what he's called me to do and say, God, you might have called the wrong person. Like, I don't think I have what it takes to do the things you've asked me to do. I don't have the mental, emotional bandwidth. I don't have the time management skills, which is probably true. I don't have half of what it takes to do the things that you've called me to do. And so, God, you might have called the wrong person. Maybe you should send someone else. And I just want to be honest with you guys, too. I'm painfully aware of this, and I'm not alone in this. Like, my suspicion is, deep down, every single one of you, maybe it's not your greatest fear, but you probably can relate. You've probably been in situations where you approach it and you're like, I don't know that I have what it takes to do the things I need to do here. Like, I don't have enough in me to get it done. And I think we can all relate when we approach an infinite holy God and he calls us to partner with him in what he's trying to do in the world. 
and we look at that and we say, God, do you know who I am? Like, have you really seen me? Because if you've really seen me, you probably wouldn't have called me. Maybe you should send someone else. And I'm bringing all this up today. We're going to be, by the way, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through chapter 4, verse 14. And I'm bringing this all up today because I think as we approach our calling with God, we need to realize that God is fully aware of our inadequacies, and yet he calls us anyway. And to illustrate that, we're going to be looking at a character by the name of Moses. So before we get to our central text today, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, we're, we're going to do a quick run through through the first two chapters of Exodus. Are you ready? Because it gives us context for what God is trying to do in Moses' life. So buckle up, we're going really quick. Exodus begins where Genesis ends. Jacob's family is in Egypt. So do you all remember Jacob from Genesis? The heel grabber guy who eventually gets named Israel. He has 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, at the end of Genesis, there's a giant famine. Joseph is in Egypt because his brothers were kind of jerks and sold him into slavery there. But that's all beside the point because God used Joseph to basically save the world. Like he's the OG Marvel superhero here. Like he saves the, he saves the world. Um, and so during this famine, Joseph moves his entire family into Egypt, and they're still there when Exodus starts. Oh, there we go. There is a little bit of a delay on this. Wait, that went all the way back a slide. Hold on a sec. Technology is great when it works, and it's my fault when it doesn't. There we go. A new pharaoh takes the throne in Exodus 1, verses 8 through 14, and this pharaoh doesn't know about Joseph. Either That can either mean that he has simply forgotten who Joseph was because it's been so much time, or it could mean that he just doesn't really care what Joseph did. And what we find out about this particular Pharaoh is he is terrified of the people of Israel. They have been multiplying in the land of Egypt. They are blessed by a God, so they're accruing wealth and possessions, and there's a lot of people. And he basically says to his top advisors, hey, if these people get any more numerous, they are going to side with our enemies in war, and we're going to be put out. Like, we can't stand against this people. And so he, subju- he subjugates them to forced labor. He subjugates them to forced labor. Oh, that's in the previous passage, sorry. Uh, And when that doesn't work and they're still multiplying and God is still blessing them, he resorts to what's essentially a systematic genocide. He goes to two two Egyptian midwives who are helping the Hebrews give birth, and he says, hey, if it's a girl, let it live. It's a boy, kill it. Basically, we're going to let them breed themselves out of existence. Like, rather than killing the ones that are already already existing because they're a valuable labor force, we're just going to prevent them from making new ones. So we're going to kill every single baby boy that comes out. The midwives, they fear God, so they don't do it. So then Pharaoh tells all the people of Egypt, hey, cast the baby boys of the Hebrews in the Nile. It's the systematic genocide because Pharaoh is afraid of the power of this people whom God is blessing. Moses is born during this genocide, but he's saved by his mother who hides him in a basket in the Nile. She keeps him for the first three months of his life. If any of you have ever had a three-month-old, they're not exactly quiet. And so she becomes afraid that the people of Egypt are going to find out that she's harboring her baby boy. So she puts him in a basket in the Nile. Lo and behold, it washes up on the shore where Pharaoh's daughter is going to take a bath. She draws it from the water. She recognizes, oh, this must be one of the Hebrew boys. And rather than doing what her daddy told her to do and kill him, she decides to have compassion on him and decides to save him. Plot twist, Moses's sister was watching this whole time. And so when Pharaoh draws the baby out of the water, she can tell she has compassion on him. She's not going to kill him. She goes, hey, would you like me to go find this baby a nurse, someone to nurse him? And Pharaoh's daughter's like, yeah, that'd be great. And so Moses's sister takes him right back to his mom. Ain't that, ain't that a blessing? Ain't that such a cool story? Isn't it even better that it actually happened? So Moses, at this point, is being nursed by his mom. He's spending his formative years there. And then as he grows up, Pharaoh's daughter adopts Moses, brings him into the household of Pharaoh. But Moses, we know, is somehow aware of his Hebrew heritage, probably because he's growing up in his mother's household 
uh, maybe until he's prepubescent or hitting puberty or something like that, so 11, 12 years old. We don't really know, but somehow he has a relationship with the Hebrew people, and he knows that he's a Hebrew, even though he's adopted into Pharaoh's house, because the very first thing that we hear Moses do is that he goes out to see his people. He sees that they're enslaved. They're being worked really, really hard. And he notice one per- notices one person in particular mistreating a Hebrew slave. And he responds by killing that Egyptian and hiding his body in the sand, hoping that no one will find out. That's Moses' first recorded action in Scripture, is murder. Not a great start. Oh, sorry, he's trying to judge his dispute. Oh my gosh, come on. I will figure this out before this is over, I promise. Okay, he tries, after the next day, he sees two Hebrews arguing, and he goes up and he says, hey guys, what's going on here? And one of them, the one who was in the wrong, says, hey, who made you judge between us? Are you just going to kill me like you did that Egyptian? And at that point, two things happen. One, Moses appears to be trying to deliver his people. But he's not doing it in the power of God. He's doing it in his own power. And so he commits murder and he assumes a position to judge others without being given that authority by God. And at this point, when the Hebrew slave says, hey, you're going to kill me like you did that Egyptian? Moses realizes the jig is up. He realizes the word is out. People know he's a murderer and Pharaoh's going to find out and he's going to have his head. And so he flees Egypt. He marries Jethro's daughter, and he becomes a shepherd. That's kind of where you would expect the story to end. Moses steps in. He's trying to deliver his people. He commits murder, tries to act as a judge, which he has no authority to do. And when it all goes south, he runs away. Like, that's the Moses that we start the book of Exodus with. He's presumptuous, he's quick to anger and wrath, probably a little bit prideful if he thinks he can intervene in this dispute, and a little bit of a coward when he runs away. That's Moses at the beginning of Exodus, and at this point, you would think that this guy would, fl- he would fade into obscurity and live the rest of his life as a shepherd. And Moses probably thought that too. But something happens in chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, and I want to read that to you real quick, because it's because of this and not Moses that Moses' story continues. Starting in verse 23, After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of their slavery, their cry for help rose to God, God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God knew. And I want to focus in on that last sentence there, God knew. It's left open-ended on purpose. Grammatically, it's probably referring to all that had come, come before it. God knew that Pharaoh had been oppressing Israel. God knew that he had been trying to genocide the people. God knew that they were suffering and crying out and groaning and longing for a savior. And I would submit for you that God knew exactly what he was about to do do about that. God knew exactly what he was going to do to remedy what appeared to be a really hopeless situation. I would submit for you, we're about to read the call of Moses. The call of Moses is not because Moses is a great guy. Moses at this point is a presumptuous, murdering, hot-headed coward. The call of Moses happens because God is a great God, and he hears his people suffering, and he is a God of salvation, and he will deliver his people. That's why the call of Moses happens. It has very little to do with Moses, actually. So let's read this call, picking up with uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. 
By the way, this is called Mount Sinai later. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a burning bush. And he looked and beheld, the bush was burning, and yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him from the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he said, do not come near. Take the sandals off your feet, for the place which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Let's talk about Moses at the burning bush, part one. So, verses one to three, Moses isn't really looking for God. He's not out on a search. He's not doing some deep soul-searching introspection. He is just being a shepherd. And we can tell this from his response to the burning bush. We know as readers that God is in the burning bush waiting to meet Moses. Moses sees it and says, hey, ain't that pretty cool? Like he sees this burning bush burning brightly, fluorescing even, and, and he's not thinking anything supernatural is happening. He's just like, what in the world is that? He's curious, but he's not looking for God. God was looking for him, though, because in verses 4 through 5, God calls out to Moses from the burning bush. He sees that Moses is approaching, and on his approach, he says, Moses, Moses, and Moses, I think at this point, is starting to have some inkling, oh, maybe this isn't just a really cool thing that I'm seeing. Maybe there's something more, because he says, here I am. Here I am. And God says to Moses, I Take off your shoes, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. We don't know if Moses did it. Presumably he did, because <laughs> typically when you hear God tell you to do something, you probably do it. And I want to camp there for just a sec. This ground isn't holy today. It's not like if you could go find where Moses met God at the burning bush that you would need to take your sandals off. That ground is holy because God is making his presence manifest in a way that is not normal. And just so you know, the reason God has him take off his shoes is because in sacred places, the ancient custom was to not wear shoes. It's a sign of respect. It's a sign of reverence for what is happening in that place. And Moses, if he did obey God, was recognizing, oh man, this ain't just a burning bush anymore. Something else is happening here. And then, God identifies himself with his people. See, God could have said, I am the God who created the heavens and the earth. That's true of him. He could have said, I am the God who preserved you from Pharaoh's hand when you fled Egypt. That is true of him. But God doesn't do that. He doesn't refer to what he's done. God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, those people whom you tried to deliver in Egypt and you failed and you fled, I'm their God. And Moses has a curious response. Moses' response isn't worship. It's not praise. He hides his face from God. Now, on the one hand, this very well could be that Moses is afraid that God is going to destroy him or that this sight suddenly becomes so awesome and awe-inspiring and terrible all at the same time that Moses becomes afraid. But I think once Moses hears who this God is, that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he's the God of the people that Moses himself abandoned, I think Moses feels shame. I think he feels guilt. And I think he feels utterly unworthy to be hearing from that God in this moment. But God is not done talking to Moses. Let's read Exodus 3, verses 7 through 12. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people 
who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen their oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of Egypt? And he said, but I will be with you, and this will be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. God calls Moses in verses 7 through 10 to be the instrument through which God delivers his people. See, God had heard of their sufferings. He knew of their groanings. He knew their desperation. And he had compassion on them, and he had come to deliver them. But as God quite often does throughout Scripture, God uses a person to do his work. And so he says, Moses, I am sending you because I care about my people, and I am going to deliver them, and you will be my instrument for that deliverance. And Moses responds by expressing his inadequacy. He says, God, who am I to go to Pharaoh? It's almost as if in the, Moses, in the back of Moses' mind, he's remembering what happened the last time he tried. He's remembering, God, do you not know what happened to me? I killed a man. I tried to judge between my people. And when Pharaoh found out, I fled. I was terrified because Pharaoh was going to kill me. Where were you then? Why didn't you deliver the people then? Why now? Who am I to do this? I don't have the power. Who am I to go talk to Pharaoh? And God responds by comforting him with probably the most comforting thing God could say. God promises to be with Moses. He says, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to deliver these people through you. And this will be a sign. I'm going to bring you back to this mountain safely. And you will serve me here. Like that promise isn't just a promise that God is going to give the law, which it is, and he will. It's a promise to Moses that, Moses, you're going to be okay. I'm going to bring you through this. I'm going to go with you, and I will be with you the entire way. And you're not going to be doing this in your power. You're going to be doing it in mine. And Pharaoh may be scary, but I'm bigger than Pharaoh. And I can deliver you from his hand. But that wasn't the end of it. Let's read Exodus 3, 13 through 22. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Come on. Go gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will do. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbors, any woman who lives in her house, for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And you shall put them on your sons and daughters. And you shall plunder the Egyptians." 
Here's what's happening here. Moses isn't quite convinced yet that God is going to use him. He objects a second time. He basically is saying, hey, if I go to these people, the last time I went to them and I tried to decide a dispute for them, they asked me, who the heck are you to decide between us? So why would that change now? Like, how are they going to believe me that I have been sent by you? What name should I give them by which I am offering to do these things for them? And so as a result, God graciously gives Moses his name and thus authorizing the task at hand. It's almost a God's stamp of approval for Moses' calling. And I want to dwell a little bit on that name real quick because it's not just any name and we can't camp out here as long as I would like because the name of God is not a, not a small thing. It's pretty weighty. It's translated in most of your Bibles as I am who I am. It can also be translated as I will be who I will be or I am who I will be. The idea isn't the, the idea in all of these things is that God is self-existent and self-determining. There is no power greater than God. God is who he is, and he is who he will be. There's nothing beyond that. There's nothing around that. There's only under it. God himself determines who he is. Now, let me tell you why that name matters to a people who are being oppressed. To a people who are being oppressed as the people of Israel were, it is hard to see any God bigger than the oppressor. It is hard to think of a God who is more powerful than the person who is literally killing your sons. Like, think about a most, the most hopeless situation you could possibly think of. Put yourself in that, and it is hard to see a God bigger than it. So when God gives his name, it's not that this is just theologically true. It is theologically true. It's also expedient in the situation. Like, it means something to those people. I am who I am. I will decide what is going to happen from here on out. Like, nothing determines who I am, and nothing hinders what I'm about to do. Because I am who I am, and I will be who I will be. And he identifies himself with the people of Israel. He says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, go to the elders, say, I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He persists in saying, I am who I will be, and guess what? I am your God too. Like, I'm the God who is above all of it. I'm the God who's outside of all of it. I'm the God who determines who I am and nobody else, and I have determined to be your God, and I will deliver you from the, from the land of Egypt. And he responds, not only does he reveal his name, he also says, here's all that I'm going to do for the people who are called by my name. I'm going to deliver them. I'm sorry, that's supposed to go from 16, oh, it does go from 16 to 22. I got it right. He says, I'm going to send you, and Pharaoh won't listen, and I know that, and that's okay, because I'm going to show you all of my wonders. I'm going to make an example out of Pharaoh. I'm going to show you just how powerful I am and just how much bigger I am than Pharaoh. And so when he sends you out, it's not going to be begrudgingly and it's not going to be temporary. He's going to send you out and they're going to send you with gifts because they're going to know my name and they're going to know the people called by my name. He gives him his name. And he seals his mission with that authority. But Moses ain't done objecting yet. Moses answers, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say to you, the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, what is in your right hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. I would too. <laughs> The Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, by, and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. This is not normal staff behavior, by the way. This is not normal of the properties of staffs. 
that they may believe that the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Oh, whoa. Did we skip a verse there? We might have skipped a verse there. Hold on. This is why I bring a physical one up here with me. Do, do, do. He threw it on the ground, so he threw it on the ground and uh, reached out your hand, Jesus with the tail, grasped it. So that, oh, no, 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 we didn't. It's just uh, a weird sentence because Hebrew be like that. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of your, their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside of his cloak, and then he took it out, and behold, that hand was leprous as snow. And then he said to him, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and then he took it out, and behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. And if they will not even believe these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some of the water from the Nile and pour it on the ground, and the water they, that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground yeah. Moses at the burning bush, part four. Moses, yet again, doubts God's call. This time he objects that the people might not believe him, even if he shares God's name. He says, you know what, God? Thank you for sealing this mission with your authority, but what if they don't believe it? What if they think I'm making it all up? And God says, all right, Moses, Here's two signs for you to do. Let's see if they think you're making up at this point. Drop your staff on the ground. He does. It's a snake. Snakes are scary. So Moses runs and God's like, pick it back up. And Moses does and it's the staff again. That's not normal. That's pretty supernatural. And it indicates that God is working through Moses. And he says, Moses, take your hand and put it in your cloak. And he does. He pulls it out. It's leprous. He goes, ah. God says, put it back in. Puts it back in and it's brand new, just like the rest of his body. The power over disease and healing of sickness and wellness only belongs to God. And so these two signs demonstrate who God is and what he's capable of doing and the fact that he's chosen Moses. And, Moses, and he even gives, he does, he does one better. He says, look, Moses, if for some reason they don't believe those two signs, here's what you do. You go to the Nile, you scoop a bowl out, you dump it on the ground, and when it hits the ground, it's going to be blood. How many of y'all think it's normal for water to turn into blood? <laughs> you do? That's a, uh, it's not, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> I promise it's not. God's saying, you know what, Moses? I, I think they're going to believe you, but in the case that they don't, Here's what you can do to show them that I am with you. But Moses ain't done yet. Verses 10 through 17. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. The irony here is that's a pretty good sentence. That's pretty well constructed. And if you've read Genesis through Numbers, You've read the five books which Moses penned, and they're widely held to be literary masterpieces. But anyway, then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth, or who makes him mute, or deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore, go, I will be your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, Moses, oh my Lord, please Send someone else. Now we're down to the heart of the issue. The, in, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron your brother the Levite? Is there not Aaron your brother the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth, and I will be your mouth, and with his mouth... And will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as a God to him. And take in your staff this, take in your hand this staff with which you shall do these signs. And that's the end of the conversation. Evidently, at that point, Moses goes. Let's break it down a little bit, though. Moses objects to God's call one final time in verse 10, claiming he is slow of speech and tongue. 
This may have been true, and what we learn is that Aaron's already on his way to remedy that situation. Moses doesn't know that yet. God does. Possibly Aaron does. I don't know. I need to go read Exodus again. I think it talks about how Aaron knew. Anyway, but the point is, Moses says, God, I can't speak to anyone. He, he shares everybody's fear of public speaking. <laughs> and God knows that. And he says, you know what, Moses? You might be afraid to speak publicly, but guess what? I made your mouth. I made your tongue. I make people blind or deaf or mute. And I open their eyes and I loosen their tongues and I allow them to speak. I am in control of all of that. And if you believe that is true, then you should go. Then you should go. Because I will be with you and I will teach you what to say. Here's the dealio. And we'll return to this in the application. But I think you need to hear this now. A lot of you are afraid to share the gospel because you don't feel like you know what to say. Do you realize that Jesus also confronted this same attitude in his disciples? When he's about to ascend... He says, hey, don't worry about what you're going to say because the Spirit will be with you and he will teach you what to say. I'm sorry, that's not when he was about to ascend. I think that is in John. I believe it is in the Last Supper <laughs> when Jesus is talking with his disciples. He's giving them this final teaching before he goes. I'm sorry that I got the reference wrong in the first part. But the principle still stands. Y'all, the people of God have always been afraid to share the truth of God and that fear is not of God. God made your mouth, he made your tongue, he gave you the ability to speak, and by golly, he is fully capable of enabling you to speak when called upon. Do not let this be an excuse to not share the gospel. Moses nevertheless objects one final time, and he begs God to send someone else. Here's the thing. Moses has heard all that God has said up until this point, and yet he still believes that he is not fit for the task that God has called him to. And I think this is also an important point because you know who God is. And you know, at least in general terms, what he has called you to do. And if you are failing to step forward in faith and pursue that task, it is not because God has not told you what to do and it's not because God hasn't promised you that he will be with you. It's because you don't believe him. But even in that, God is gracious. He becomes angry with Moses because who wouldn't at this point? But he's also gracious. He says, you know what, Moses? Maybe you're not a great spokesman. I'll give you a spokesman. But go. And so Moses does. And that's the end of the conversation. And I think that this was a turning point in Moses' life because let's look at what Moses did after the bush. He ultimately accomplishes the task that God set for him and delivered his people from Egypt. He goes to Egypt. He speaks to the elders. He goes before Pharaoh. Ten times, Pharaoh says no. Ten times, Moses goes, and eventually he leads his people out. And when Pharaoh relents one final time and starts chasing these people through the wilderness, God parts the seas using Moses' staff. The people walk through it and Pharaoh's entire army drowns. Not only did he lead them out of Egypt, he's also responsible for delivering the law of God to the people of God. At one point, Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, and God gives him the Ten Commandments with the rest of the law, and he delivers that to the people. Like, he becomes the spokesman for God, to the people. Of course, he's still using Aaron. But that's not the end of the story. After leading these people for 40 years, or perhaps during leading them for 40 years, he's responsible for pinning the first five books of the Bible. If you don't know what these are called, we call them the Pentateuch. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. 
There's some of the most beautiful works ever penned. There's some of the most well-structured works ever penned. Like the structure itself is deeply meaningful. And people have debated for centuries on just how to understand it because it's so complex and ornate. Moses wrote that, obviously under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But by his hand, he wrote it. And y'all, just so you know, the prophets, if they do anything, it's expounding upon what happens in the Torah. Y'all, the gospel itself is rooted in what God did in the Torah. Like, this is the foundation out of which the rest of the Bible blossoms. And Moses is responsible, at least partially, for writing it. Here's a presumptuous murderer who ultimately ends up being called the most humble man who ever lived in numbers. Here's a man who is slow of speech and not good with words, by his own admission, writing some of the greatest literary artifacts common to all of humanity. Here's a man who felt woefully inadequate for the task which God had called him to do And yet, God did it through him anyway. But we don't just meet Moses at the burning bush. In fact, he's not the primary person we meet at the burning bush. We meet God at the burning bush. And here's who God has shown himself to be. The God we meet at the burning bush is the God who calls imperfect people to participate in his perfect plan. Y'all, why didn't God just deliver Israel on his own? He could have. He's God. He is who he is. And no one can change that. And only he can determine who he is going to be. Well, in his sovereignty, God chose to use Moses. And there is no other reason above that or below that or beside it. God chose to use Moses and God historically, has always chosen to use imperfect people. Go through the major moments of God's story. He's always calling people to work alongside him to accomplish his plan. And he empowers them and equips them to do it. And in fact, if Paul is to be believed, it's not because they are perfect or that God is going to make them perfect. It's precisely in their imperfection that God has shown to be who he is. And so he calls imperfect people to participate in his perfect plan. The God we meet at the burning bush is the God who empowers those whom he calls to accomplish what he calls them to do. Look, God knew Moses wasn't cut out for the task, and Moses was right for suspecting that he wasn't. After all, who would be? Which among you thinks you could go talk to the ruler of the most important kingdom in the world today? I guess that would be... Oh, that would be the U.S. But um, imagine walking into Russia, walking up to Vladimir Putin and saying, hey, thus saith the Lord, dot, dot, dot. How many of you in your own power would make it out of that country alive? How many in your own power would convince him to do what you think God is telling him to do? The answer is none of us in here could have done what Moses did, and Moses couldn't either. And that's kind of the point. God called him and he empowered him. Moses' staff was just a stick before God's holy power decided to work through it. Moses' words were just words before the Holy Spirit inspired them and caused them to be written down. Like, there's nothing special about Moses, except for the fact that the God who called him, called him to a special purpose, and then equipped him to accomplish it. The God we meet at the burning bush is the God who promises his presence to his people. Y'all, this is one of the more understated things in this narrative, but I think it's one of the most important. Every step of the way, God is promising to be with Moses. From the first thing that Moses subjects to, how can I, who am I to go to Pharaoh? God says, I'll be with you. And what does he say to Mo- Moses' last objection? He says, I'll be with you and I will p- 
put, I will teach your mouths what to say. Throughout the whole thing, God is promising his presence to Moses. And he's promising his presence to his people. Y'all, it's not by accident that one of the last things that Jesus said to his disciples is, Lo, I will be with you until the end of the age. Like he gives them a commission. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And then he said, And behold, I will be with you. Moses accomplishes nothing that he accomplishes apart from the presence of God with him. And the hope in that is that we don't have to be powerful enough to accomplish what God has called us to do. We just have to be obedient and allow the God who is with us to work through us. The God who calls you. Let's talk about the cross for a second. Because God reveals himself to Moses in the burning bush, and he gives himself a name, I am who I am. And if the burning bush reveals who God is, the cross reveals it even more. And at the cross, we learn another name for God, and that name is Jesus Christ. In the calling from the bush to participate in God's salvation to be the agent through which God delivered the people of Israel. Well, the call from the cross is also to participate in God's salvation. The call from the cross is to pick up our own crosses and follow after our our Lord, Jesus Christ, and to die to ourselves and to accept him as the Lord of our lives, and in doing so, become changed people who then can go out and share the good news of what Jesus has done for us. And if the calling from the bush was meaningful, the calling from the cross is even more meaningful. So we are called to. And God is calling you, not just all of us, not just all of humanity, you specifically. God has something he wants to do in your life. And you will probably never see a burning bush as cool as that would be. Well, you've probably seen a burning bush. You probably won't see one that doesn't burn up. As cool as that would be, you'll probably never see it. But you have the word of God in front of you, and the word of God calls you to do something. Most generally, that's to fulfill the great commission, to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that he's commanded them. Like if Christians are supposed to do anything, it's at least that. And whatever particular things God has called you to do in pursuit of that calling, make no mistake, it's God calling you. And if he's called you, he will empower you. And if he's empowering you, it's because he's with you, at work through you to do the things that he is determined to do. So how will you respond? Y'all, it's Promotion Sunday, so I get to advocate a little bit for our children's and our youth ministries. Maybe God has called you to youth or children's ministry. Yes, it's not delivering the Israelites from Egypt. Thank God, because that, I would be terrified too. But for some of you, that is a terrifying prospect. You are probably scared out of your wits of youth and children. And honestly, what? yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Youth can be scary, and so can kids. More seriously, though, you probably doubt your ability to step into that role. Don't. Don't doubt. If God is calling you to do that, do it and trust that he is going to be with you. Maybe God is calling you to ministry. Maybe you've doubted that calling because you think, man, I am not a put-together person. I have sins. I have struggles. I don't know enough about the Bible. I don't know enough about theology. I don't know enough about how to have another conversation with another human being, let alone talk to them about Jesus. You know what? If God's called you to ministry, step out in faith and pursue that calling because he will be with you. I don't know, maybe God has called you to share your faith with the person next door or the person who sits next to you at work or with your kids and you are terrified to do it 
because you don't feel up to the task. On the one hand, you are right. But on the other hand, that's never what it's been about to begin with. The God who called you will be with you and will empower you and work through you to do what he has determined to do.